Okay. So, good evening. So, okay. So, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Colon Ramos, uh, virtual talk. So, uh, probably many of you know, Daniel was born and raised in Puerto Rico. He did his elementary and also his high school there. And then he went to Harvard where he obtained his Bachelor of Art. He did his PhD in, in Duke in the lab of Sally Kornblut, uh, working on the molecular mechanisms underlying apoptosis. There he identified a viral family of reaper-like uh, proteins that induce apoptosis. After his PhD, uh, he joined the lab of uh, Kang Chen, Stanford, and shift his focus of research to the developmental neurobiology in C. elegans. And then in 2008, uh, he started his own lab in, in jail, both during his postdoc and then uh, in his own lab. He had made a uh, seminal contribution to the understanding of how synapses are formed, how they are assembled, and how they, they, they change to modulate uh, memory formation and also uh, to change behavior in, in worms. So his discovery has been published in very high impact journals. Uh, and he has been recognized for, by several organizations like Howard Hughes and also the National Academy of Sciences. But uh, I want also, I want to emphasize uh, that Daniel's contribution to science is not limited to, to, to his work in, in his lab. Uh, Daniel is strongly committed to, to promoting science and to providing opportunities for un, underrepresented groups in Latin America, especially in Puerto Rico. Probably many of you have heard about uh, Ciencia Puerto Rico. That is a network, a collaborative network that he found uh, that provides uh, promotion and professional development to PhD students or candidates and also to researchers in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I will probably to, to, to sum up his his idea or his commitment with science or the, the, to the um, or, or his commitment to, to, to the universal access to science. I, I would like to read a sentence that I took from internet. I don't know if it is true, Daniel, I hope so. But during his thesis defense a long time ago, so he said, oh he dedicated his 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 thesis to those who could have done a better job than I, but never received the opportunities. And later, may they one day receive the opportunity to share their knowledge and their skills in a society without prejudices. So thank you very much, Daniel, for being here virtually, and we hope to have you in person in, 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 the, in the next uh, Latin American World Meeting. And we look forward to, to your talk. Thank you very much. Voy, voy a empezar en... Voy a empezar agradeciendo en español. Esa, esa cita sí fue de mi tesis, okay. eh, de mi tesis doctoral. Y quiero agradecer profundamente la, la invitación a los organizadores. Me, hacía, me hace mucha ilusión participar hoy acá, aunque sea virtualmente. Quería estar allá en persona, pero no, no se dio porque cuando se movió la conferencia confligía con otros compromisos que ya tenía. Pero me hace mucha ilusión participar en el futuro y poder... Eh, conocer a más colegas latinoamericanos y poder restablecer los lazos de amistad y, y colaboración que ya tengo con muchos de ustedes. So today I'm going to be uh, sharing some work that I'm actually uh, very excited to get people's thoughts on, particularly from this community, because it has to do with a theme of metabolism that I know is very much um, active in in many labs in in South America, and it's actually coming back into the focus of um, of many labs uh, in, in North America and in Europe. And I, you know, I, I wasn't smart enough to recognize like other people, like my friend Diego de Mendoza, who has been working on this for a long time. I wasn't smart enough to recognize the importance of metabolism as, as fundamental as it is in the context of my, my question of interest, which is the cell biology of neurons. But luckily for me, we work in a, a genetic system like C. elegans and uh, C. elegans showed me that it was important to think about it. And, and the corner that I think, or that I used to think about this problem is the following. So this is a drawing by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, where you can appreciate the uh, architecture of neurons, the specificity which with, with which synapses are established, the way that, that then governs how information flows. 
And these are polarized cells with exquisite architecture. Uh, the architecture is present in C. elegans as well. And then you, you know, we have all this knowledge about these metabolic pathways that we understand them more in this context, in this um, very rich biochemical context. And my interest is in understanding how those reactions, those biochemical reactions that we know so much about, how do they map in the cell biological context of neurons? And I'll explain why in the next few slides. But first, I wanted to tell you how uh, C. elegans taught us that this was an important problem to think about. And uh, well, let me start by actually summarizing what I'm going to be telling you about today. So my lab has become interested in this question of the cell biological organization of glycolysis. This is a summary of the glycolytic reaction. It's a core reaction in that um, pathway that I show of metabolism. And today I'm going to be showing you that we have um, gathered evidence that glycolytic enzymes, which are usually thought of as distributed in the cytosol, are, can actually be sub subcellularly compartmentalized. And this subcellular compartmentalization, we believe, corresponds to a compartment that is important for glycolytic function that have been hypothesized to exist by biochemists as you know, as um, long ago as 50 years ago, and and also I'm going to be showing you some evidence that these glycolytic compartments are driving um, the reaction of glycolysis, and that this reaction of glycolysis that is compartmentalized will impact synaptic function. But I'm, let me walk you through what our system is and how we ended up looking at glycolysis. So my interests are in how synapses are established, how they change, how they're modulated. And what we do is that we use C. elegans, we either adapt or uh, harness the knowledge of um, actually probably many people here in the audience and certainly many people from our community that have characterized cell specific promoters to then drive fluorophores in specific neurons. Here you're looking, for example, at one of our, of our favorite neurons, not the only one that we work on, but one of our favorite ones, which is called AIY. It had, here's the cell body, it has a neurite that extends into the nerve ring. And the synaptic regions of AIY I have highlighted here with this dash box, we know that these synapses are there because we have cell biological markers, but also because of the work that people like John White and more recently, Mei Zhen, Aravi Samuels, and others that have been working on connectomes have done. And that work has revealed that the synaptic distribution is enriched in this area. And you have a synaptic rich region over here. You can see it here. And then you have these discrete clusters of presynaptic specializations in, in this distal part of the of the neurite. And those of you that are familiar with our work will know that we have done studies to identify a role for glia over here to drive the formation of those synapses and another, a number of other cell biological processes that are important in the assembly of those synapses. And the way that we do that work is that we do forward genetic screens. And we identify mutants that look like this. So here's a mutant in which, for example, instead of having those puncta that you can actually count, one, two, three, four, five, six, you, this, they're really hard to count here. And the reason they're hard to count is because that signal is now diffusely localized in either the membrane or the cytosol, but it's diffusely localized. We like this type of phenotype. The reason we like it is because normally we're looking, and in this screen we were looking for scaffolding molecules that are holding together this protein that we have labeled here RAP3. So RAP3 is a synaptic vesicle associated protein. I drew a cartoon diagram of a synapse here. You can see these are my synaptic vesicles, and this is GFP, tag to them. And we're looking for a scaffolding molecules that will be working in the background here that are holding these vesicles together. And that's why you get a cluster of vesicles as represented in the wild type organism. When you get rid of those molecules, then you get a diffuse localization of that signal. What was very confusing at the time about this mutant is that it gave us a beautiful phenotype, but that phenotype wasn't a phenotype that we observed all the time. We only observed that after having the animals under the cover sleep for at least 10 minutes. And we didn't know what to make out of it, but eventually, and this work is published, and I'm just going to summarize it in this slide so I can move on to the newer stuff. What we found was that when we mounted the animals, they started with this phenotype. Then after we had them underneath the cover sleep, we were inducing energy stress. And the reason we're inducing energy stress is because, and we all do this when we put these animals under cover sleeps, we're creating hypoxic conditions. We actually show this if we make new slides in which uh, we flow oxygen or we make these slides oxygen permeable, we don't get these phenotypes. But when we induce energy stress through hypoxia, which inhibits oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, 
then you start getting this phenotype in these mutants. You don't get it in wild type animals, in these mutants. And it's a phenotype that emerges through time. You can see it here. So these are three of those synaptic vesicle clusters. And through time, as time goes on, you start getting a diffuse focalization. So what's going on here? What we found out was that normally the synaptic vesicle cycle, so this, these vesicles are actually in, in the synapses and they're cycling, they're fusing with the membrane, being recycled back in through endocytosis. And that, that cycle is being powered through energy and metabolites that are being produced through two reactions, two main reactions. One of them is oxfor, uh, oxidative phosphorylation from the mitochondria. The other one is glycolysis. When, you, when we normally mount the animals underneath the cover sleeve, we're inducing transient hypoxia. So the mitochondria is gonna be is gonna work less well, but we still have glycolysis. So that's why we don't see phenotypes. That's actually why we can mount animals underneath the cover sleep. Otherwise, we will all have to, to you know look for other type of screens here for synaptic vesicles. But it, the the screens work, and the reason you can mount them is because glycolysis still sustains the cycle. But in these mutants, glycolysis is affected. So now you have a double whammy. You have glycolysis affected, and you make them transiently hypoxic, so they're sensitized because glycolysis is affected. And then instead of this vesicle cycling, you run out of energy transiently, and that inhibits synaptic vesicle endocytosis, which is the most energy vulnerable step of this cycle. And that GFP gets stuck in the plasma membrane, and that's why you get that diffuse localization. And if you're confused about this, or if you want to learn more about it, I encourage you to look at this publication, but I'm going to start talking more specifically about another part of the project. But this is the foundation of why we started looking at glycolysis, because glycolysis is actually important for synaptic function. So the lessons that we learned from that er those early studies were that endocytosis um, specifically was an ener energy vulnerable step that was particularly affected as synapses when there were defects in glycolysis and when there was energy stress due to transient hypoxia. Other glycolytic proteins also affect endocytosis. Uh, uh, the mutant that we actually identified was a mutant for phosphofructokinase 1, but the reason I'm not talking about its identity is because any, any lesion in, in glycolytic proteins that are expressed in neurons will give you a similar phenotype. We showed in the paper that there were functional consequences with the uh, collaborative studies with Eric Jorgensen, where we measured the electrophysiology and behavior, and essentially these animals are exhausted. So they are normal for a little bit. And then if, if they have to do repeated you know, exercise, like swimming, for example, they get exhausted. But the, the take home message, the most important part is that glycolysis is important for synaptic function, particularly during energy stress, particularly during mitochondrial dysfunction. And these findings that we had that I'm summarizing here were consistent with other studies that were being published around the same time, particularly from Tim Ryan's lab, where he had actually demonstrated similarly and, but before us, that the most energy vulnerable step of the synaptic vesicle cycle was synaptic vesicle endocytosis. But let me let me tell you when this project really caught my imagination. So it, out of practice in my lab, because we're cell biologists, when we identify new genes, we look at where they get expressed, where they're acting, and also where they are localizing. And when we label glycolytic proteins, I wasn't expecting much because you know you open a textbook of metabolism and are you know the common knowledge of of where glycolysis is is that it's in the cytosol, is and and at that it, it's you know it's kind of distributed, and that is actually correct. If you look at the at phosphofructokinase, for example, which is one of the rate limiting enzymes of glycolysis, and it was the gene product of the lesion that we had identified, and you label it in a neuron, you're gonna see that you know it's in the cell body, which we can see here, and in this neuride, and maybe there's a little bit more here. But whatever, you know, it's not that interesting. So, but this is what happens when you stimulate that neuron with channel rhodopsin. You see this, which is a dramatic relocalization of the phosphofructokinase. Actually, if you make the animals transiently hypoxic, so again, the condition that we we're using to identify those lesions, this is what you see. These are two movies where we're labeling uh, neurons in the ventral nerve cord. These are the cell bodies, these are the neurites. This is before we make the animals transiently hypoxic. I'm going to play the movies now. And what you're going to see is an almost complete relocalization of phosphofructokinase into foci. So this, I mean, as a cell biologist, this is, this is gorgeous, right? So this really caught our imagination. I didn't know what it meant at the time. I, again, like I, I was just kind of following the cell biology and the genetics, but I wasn't really sure about what it meant. So one of the first questions that we had was, what are these clusters? So, you know, 
a good hypothesis is that they're stress granules or something like that. So stress granules are foci that form due to stressful conditions. And in C. elegans, they have been studied. Uh, one of the proteins that is used to label stress granules is TR1. So we looked at the co-localization of TR1 and phosphofructokinase. The first thing that I'll say is that TR1 doesn't make it out to the neri. So that was the first evidence that these are not stress granules. So we had to look in the cell body. But even in the cell body, conditions like heat shock conditions that cause the formation of stress granules did not, for, did not cause the, the formation of, of condensates or foci in phosphofructokinase 1. And transient hypoxia, and I have emphasized transient, I'm talking about minutes, because if you make if you induce the animals to prolong hypoxia, then TR1 is also going to form stress granules. But during transient hypoxia for a few minutes, only phosphofructokinase 1 forms stress, uh, uh, not stress granule, forms foci, and those foci do not co-localize with stress granule markers. So we had no evidence that these were stress granules. We couldn't find any evidence for that. What we found evidence for was that these foci were in the nerites. I just showed you that they also form in the cell body, but in the nerite, they were predominantly forming near presynaptic sites. So here we're labeling the presynaptic sites. These are the phosphofructokinase foci, and you can see very neat co-localization between the two of them. It's not, it's not perfect. Like for example, look at this site here, but it's it's very close. It, no question, they're localizing near these presynaptic sites. So, the, you know, this this actually was, I found this fascinating because <laughs> this was my. This cartoon diagram was my map of metabolism at synapses at the time. And I think it represents the map of many people, which is that, you know, you, you do think a little bit about metabolism, but more in the context of mitochondria, which are these membrane-bound organelles that are transported out to synapses. But missing in that picture, quite literally, is glycolysis. Where is glycolysis going on, happening? Where, you know, is it compartmentalized? Although if you start looking actually at studies done in humans, like fMRI studies or PET, PET scans and things like that, all those studies, what they're actually probing, what they're measuring is metabolism. And it is known from those studies that aerobic glycolysis is important for brain metabolism and function and that it increases locally with neuronal activity. That's well established. It's also known that there's an increasing number of diseases associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. And I just told you earlier, that we were seeing a relationship between glycolysis and mitochondria, in which glycolysis became particularly important during mitochondrial dysfunction. So I started daydreaming about the possibility that glycolysis, uh, and it, this is not a far-fetched possibility or something that I have only thought about. It's just something that is particularly interesting in the context of the synapse. But I started thinking, what if glycolysis is, is, is neuroprotective to some of these uh, diseases that affect mitochondrial dysfunction? And what happens with age is that you de decrease in metabolism, and that's why you have the emergence of these phenotypes like uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases that are associated with age. And also th there's a recognition that, you know, mitochondria goes to synapses, but about 50% of mitochondria in, in, you know, in, in connectomes where this has been carefully quantified, our 50% of mitochondria are not, at, uh, sorry, of synapses do not have mitochondria associated with them. So many synapses do not have mitochondria. Actually, there are many tissues that do not have mitochondria. Red blood cells do not have mitochondria. Lens cells in our eyes do not have mitochondria, like implying the importance of glycolysis in that. As I did my research, and again, I'm approaching this as a geneticist, I found this paper, which was both um, exciting and humbling. <laughs> and it, was, it was humbling because here's Harvey Noll, who was a person I've never met, uh, publishing in 1978, essentially our observations in C. elegans. Let me show you the last paragraph from his paper. The results reported here in, so, so first like a preamble, what Harvey was doing is that he was taking, um, you know, this is way before UFP. This is like 30 years before UFP or 20 some years before UFP. So he was um, doing biochemistry and he was taking nerve endings, which have synapses, purifying them and looking at what metabolic enzymes were associated with synapses. This is the last paragraph of the paper. The results reported herein were obtained under conditions very different from those existing in vivo. Therefore, whether the enzymes are associated with the synaptosomal membranes in vivo remains to be determined. It is nevertheless intriguing to speculate that if nerve endings glycolytic enzymes were particulate, they may be associated perhaps to provide glycolytic energy for secretion. So the, he couldn't do his experiments in vivo. If he could have done his experiments in vivo, he would have scooped us 30 years before. But, but he essentially is hypothesizing exactly what we're finding, and his results are consistent 
with what we were seeing. And when we dug deeper into this field, it turns out that there was this hypothesis proposed by biochemists at the time that there must be some sort of metabolic subcompartment that held together these glycolytic enzymes. And the, the hypothesis went something like this. It was, you know, glycolysis is a processive reaction in which the product of one reaction upstream is the substrate of the next enzyme downstream. Biochemists had amazing control of glycolytic reactions. They could, you know, they could measure the enzymatic reactions. They could measure the speed, the production of the different metabolites. And in spite of the fact that they understood that very well, they couldn't explain the rates of glycolysis that you saw in vivo. So the only way that they could explain it was if, if these proteins were actually compartmentalized. They couldn't explain it if they were just diffusely localized and distributed in the cell. So they came up with this hypothesis, which was the, the glycolytic metabolism. The idea was that glycolytic enzymes are actually co-located. They form multi-enzyme complexes, and they're shunting the different metabolites so that they're processed by one enzyme, one enzyme to the next to accelerate the rates of glycolysis. This was hugely controversial. And the reason it was hugely controversial is because they couldn't, they didn't have the tools to be able to examine this rigorously. So it became a circular argument. They will have a bi biochemical reaction. They will see it. They couldn't explain it. So they will come up with this hypothesis or this explanation. So the explanation was a hypothesis to something that they couldn't explain. So it became circular. So, they, so, so that's why it became controversial. And here are two quotes from two people at the time. At times in biochemical articles, it was not unusual to propose in a somewhat derogatory fashion, just introduce another compartment when one was faced with inexplicable results, right? So this is a quote from 1982, but this one is my favorite from a proponent of the glycolytic metabolism hypothesis. The concept of metabolic compartmentalization was a sort of explanation to be used when all else had failed and the imagination had run dry. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is like a killer, right? And this guy, Vivian Moses, was actually one of the proponents of the hypothesis. So uh, th this is way before GFP. They couldn't probe this in vivo. They could only do biochemistry. Biochemistry can only make it so far. So I became excited about the possibility of understanding this. The reason being that if glycolysis is compartmentalized and that is actually important for its function, that means that you have a whole other layer of regulation on top of the biochemistry that is important that we have been ignoring. And so these were the questions that we wanted to address. Are glycolytic proteins compartmentalized in vivo? Is the subcellular localization important for their function? And what are the physiological implications of the subcellular um, distribution? And we've been examining those systematically in C. elegans. It has been a really fun project, far more challenging than I originally envisioned. I'll explain why. Most of the reasons are that even in C. elegans, we're lacking a lot of tools to be able to explain examine this rigorously, but my lab has been collaborating and working with different labs to kind of pioneer uh, th this examination of the cell biology of glycolysis in the context of C. elegans. And by the way, anything that is that I'm showing here, it, if people want or need, you can write us and we'll be happy to share. So one of the first things that we did is that we collaborated with Derek Albrecht and to, so that instead of just putting the worms underneath a cover slip on a slide, we could have a precise way of controlling the oxygen levels that they were seeing. So we can make them transiently hypoxic and we could get movies like the one I'm going to show you here. So it gave us great quantitative precision, both temporally, spatially, and in terms of how much oxygen they're seeing. Uh, this is again, like a neride where you're going to see, this is the neride, this is the cell body. I, I will, I'm going to draw your attention here first. I'll play the movie twice, but here you can see normoxic now, hypo sorry, let me, let me start again. <laughs> so the white circle in the right hand, right hand corner, over here is going to represent hypoxic conditions. And there are going to be two cycles of transient hypoxia, normoxia, transient hypoxia, normoxia. So we start normoxic and now hypoxic. And then let's see what happens. There's a condensed forming. Then normoxic, it goes away. Then transient hypoxia, again, second round, it forms in the same place. Uh, normoxia goes away. We made a lot of these movies. I like to show this one because it's the one that the students have sent me, but we have a lot made a lot of these movies like this. So you can look anywhere in the near right. You can look here if you want, where it looks like there's some structures already. And what you're going to see is that under hypoxia, these things are going to become more tight, more condensed. There they are, more, more spherical. And then normoxia, they're going to relax. And then hypoxia, more tight. And then normoxia, they're going to relax. Okay, so I, I just want to emphasize two things. One of them is that they form at specific times upon these conditions of energy stress. The other one is they're forming in the same places. And we believe 
those places correspond to synapses. We've seen this for other glycolytic proteins such as aldolase and GPD-3. So this type of movies gave us an opportunity to understand what, it, what are the what are the features of a phosphofructokinase that cause it to form these, these foci, these condensates. And around that time, Tony Hyman had published an article where he showed that ATP actually dissolved condensates. It acted like a hydrotrope. So I had invited him to come and give a talk here at Yale, and we started talking, and we established a collaboration that was eventually funded by the Human Frontier Science Program. And I, I did a sabbatical there last year to be able to like push this forward. I just wanted to show you some of our advances. And uh, But the concept that we started examining that you might have heard about is that in cell biology, most of our understanding of compartmentalization comes from the existence of lipid bilayers and how lipid bilayers actually forms compartments that hold things together. Mitochondria, lysosomes, endosomes, the nuclei, uh, the ER, the Golgi, name your favorite compartment. The reason that we know about those compartments is because people have done EM, lipids staying well with EM, so they have been able to identify those compartments through EM, which is kind of the foundation of cell biology. The idea of liquid phase separation is that you have other compartments that can also form through biophysical principles, not unlike the ones that separate oil and water, that are also membrane-less organelles, are organelles that are invisible through EM, because we don't have these nice membranes that create nice boundaries, but they're still important for the compartmentalization of the reactions. So we wanted to examine, are these foci that are forming transiently of phosphofructokinase following dynamics similar to what you will see for liquid 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 phase separation? So we made movies of how these foci were forming, and we didn't find any evidence that they were being transported or moving. What they looked like they were doing was condensing. So they start out a little bit more diffuse, and then they form more. They they become more condensed, more concentrated. The importance of that condensate. And here here's a chymograph where we're starting with the diffuse localization, and then looking at the condensates here, and you can see them through time. And what you're not seeing here are diagonal lines. You get diagonal lines when these things are being transported through time, and we don't see that. So we we what we see is a concentration. So that is a hallmark of a condensate. You can see it here also. The importance of the condensate is that these condensates form through this um, liquid-liquid type of phase separation. And to examine the liquid-like properties, we did these biophysical experiments in which we will partially bleach the, the condensate. If it's a solid, what will happen is you partially bleach it like this, and it will stay like in that way. But if it's a liquid, this is a compartment. And what's going to happen is here is going to decrease. And over here, where you bleach, that is going to increase because the, because it's going to be moving within the compartment. And that's exactly what we see. You can quantify this. So here, this is the quantification. And you can quantify the, you can even like do something like quantifying viscosity, for example, under normoxia and hypoxia. This was a lot of fun. There, there are a number of assumptions where you do these physical quantifications in vivo. But this is consistent with changes in molecular dynamics during condensation. So. What is causing the formation of these condensates? And again, some of this work is published, so I'm kind of going a little fast through it. I'm not showing you all the evidence, for example, that we generated to show that these are liquid, li that, that these are phase separating following um, fissures consistent with liquid liquid phase separation. But we published this paper in Journal of Biophysics for those of you that are interested. But I did want to emphasize this one point, which is that one of the fascinating things about glycolytic proteins, or one of the things that I find fascinating, is that almost all of the proteins in the reaction, they, they don't work in isolation. They actually form dimers or tetramers or higher order structures. PF, PFK, for example, is a dimer of dimers. So it forms a tetramer, but it's actually the, the structure itself is a dimer. So it's, it's, a, it's, a di it's, it's a tetramer formed by a composition of dimers. And this has been very well characterized, how it happens. It's thought to be the active state of PFK. And it requires this, this interaction between these amino acids. So we wanted to understand, is condensate formation dependent on the formation of these tetramers? And when we made this mutation, we could still express the protein. It's still stable in vivo, but we don't see the formation of the condensate. So the formation of the tetramer is necessary. The importance of that is when you look at these old biochemical papers, it turns out that PFK forms tetramers, and that's how we conceptualize it today because tetramer was the smallest unit that the biochemist purified that was fully active. 
but it also forms higher order oligomers that are equally active. It forms octomers, it forms 16 mers, it forms 32 mers. So it's forming these higher order oligomers, which are, which we believe depend on the formation of the tetramer, and we believe underpin the formation of these condensates. We uh, went on to uh, hypothesize that this association of PFK with itself was important. And if we could reconstitute it, we could drive the formation of condensates. So we use the system called uh, CRY2, which is a self-association domain. We fused it with PFK. We made it into two different colors. And what we observed was that PFK that we had labeled with M-Sherry and put this CRY2 domain into, it will form these condensates. But Interestingly, I found this really, really fascinating, was that if you co-express there PFK that did not have the CRY2 domain, so it has no way of interacting with this, except through the PFK-PFK interaction, it's no longer diffused during normoxia. So this is all during normoxia. This is not during hypoxia. During normoxia, when it should be diffused. So the, the self-association is driving the formation of the condensates, and then it pulls in the other PFK that doesn't have CRY2, through the PFK-PFK interaction. If you get rid of this tetramer, um, I'm not showing that here, but if you, it's in the paper. If you get rid of this tetramer um, interaction um, motif, then, then it doesn't get drawn in to, on, into these condensates. But not only is, and, and these things are functional and they rescue the, the phenotypes in the synapse, but not only is it drawing in the PFK, actually you can look at other glycolytic proteins such as aldolase, and you find that when you have this motif of CRY2 and it drives the condensates of PFK, the condensates of PFK will then drive the condensation of other glycolytic proteins such as aldolase. So this is this is actually in this paper. So, so we believe that what's happening here is that PFK forms higher order oligomers through the ability to form tetramers that are important for the formation of those condensates and that drives a fit forward reaction that then results in the formation of these condensates. And um, if you go back you know, to, to these uh, classical papers from the 80s, I just want to read this here. Our results, um, one second, yes, I have the, this thing covering, sorry. Our results and those of, of Reinhardt, who was another scientist, agree with prior observations by several investigators, which were suggestive of a possible concentration dependent activity for animal phosphofructokinase. Although the extrapolation to physiological concentration was uncertain. This is what they had done in this experiment. Let me actually show you. They're measuring the reaction of PFK. And they can see that in the control reaction, you have, you have this increase of ATP. And then you know, it, it self-inhibits. So all of a sudden, it decreases, right? If you concentrate the enzyme, that self-inhibition goes away. So it, it, can, stay, it, can, stay actually, um, it can stay active for longer for longer, uh, longer micromolar concentrations of ATP. If you put PEG, which what PEG does is that it, it's now well known to induce the formation of condensates because it's actually gonna, it's a crowding agent. So, and, and we have now in collaboration with Tony Hyman shown that for some, for several glycolytic proteins, what PEG is doing is just inducing the formation of condensates. So we believe that this condition here that they're testing is the formation of a condensate in which again, now this, uh, this enzyme is staying active for longer and the effects, the inhibitory effects of ATP are not affecting the protein. But back in this study, they, they already hypothesized that and they said the common denominator is to favor the aggregation of the enzyme to its normal in vivo state. Presumably the enzyme prevailing in the present studies as well as in vivo is a tetramer in equilibrium with higher aggregates, which is what we think we're seeing in, this, in the condensates. The results show here that changes in the state of aggregation may be considered a regulatory device by non-covalent interconversion. So I, we believe our studies are, are consistent with, with, this, with this literature. This is what I have shown you for phosphofructokinase, but that's obviously not the only enzyme in glycolysis. Here are, um, here's the reaction. We have then systematically gone and examined different enzymes in this pathway. And I wanted to show you uh, this one, which is actually, let me just first orient you. Is this GPI very, enzyme? Very minutes, works... Daniel, sorry. Okay, thank you. It works after the intake of glucose. Uh, GPI works to 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 convert glucose to fructose phosphate, and and um, so it, it works at this stage. And this is worked by a graduate student Ian Gonzalez. And there are two isoforms. This is this is one of the difficulties, but also one of the exciting findings that we had was that you know we at the beginning I said okay let's label all the glycolytic proteins. And then it turned out that even in C. elegans, which is relatively simple as compared to vertebrates in terms of the, of the amount and, and uh, number of glycolytic proteins, 
There are different isoforms. And the isoforms are not, you know, they're not super different, but they're different. So these two isoforms of, of GBI, for example, they only differ in this area, which is about 30 residues. So this, so GPI forms a dimer, which we're representing here. And there's a GPI A and GPI B, and the GPI B has this N-terminal domain that's absent in the A. Other than that, they're identical. In the catalytic domain, in the other regions are identical. But when you look at their subcellular localization, this is how they look. This one forms these condensates or these aggregates, these foci. Now, they're not aggregates. They're, they're actually more like foci. And this one is diffusely localized in the cytosol. And these foci actually localize to synapses. So, so then we started thinking, well, what if these different isoforms have different properties, different abilities of localizing the enzymes? And that's why they're different isoforms for different glycolytic enzymes. So we started systematically examining this. I have circled in red enzymes for which we have already found evidence that they're subcellularly compartmentalized. All of these enzymes that we have found evidence that they're subcellularly compartmentalized, we have seen at synapses in neurons. Hexokinase, GPI, phosphofructokinase, aldolase, GAPDH, PIG, and also we have been examining other enzymes from other side pathways that similarly localize to, to, to synapses. So here, here's the bottom line of that work. Glycolytic, we're finding consistently that glycolytic enzymes are subcellularly compartmentalized, but, and this is important, their compartmentalization it varies depending on the isoform. It varies depending on the condition. I show you for phosphofructokinase on the resting conditions is diffusely localized. So you have to induce energy stress. And it's, it, it varies depending on the tissue and it has to do with the tissue which is it gets expressed. So we believe that maybe one of the reasons this has been missed besides the fact that people don't look at the cell biology of metabolism that much is because you need to do these studies in vivo to be able to see these compartmentalizations. They co-localize into synaptic compartments and the, and the mechanisms of localization we're finding are genetically separable. So though they're co-localizing, they depend on different factors to actually make it to the compartments. So, but importantly, what is the role of subcellular compartmentalization of glycolysis? And I'll finish with that this last part. So we were really, really lucky that after we published our paper, uh, Dick Goodman, who was the, um, he, he's now retired. Well, he he's now in my lab, actually. He joined my lab, but he retired from the Volume Institute, but he used to be the director of the Volume Institute. He uh, came to the lab to do a sabbatical and, and inspired in our problem when he went back to his lab, he uh, refocused his research direction to actually develop a sensor for FBP, which is the metabolite that is produced by phosphofructokinase. And the sensor works great, actually. And I, we're having a workshop, an international one meeting to show the community how, how this works, but I'm gonna summarize here quickly. So it's based off Bacillus subtilis, that expresses an enzyme, a gene that is CGGR called central glycolytic gene repressor. It essentially binds to FBP. And what they did is that they repurp repurposed that binding pocket and created a circularly permutated GFP sensor that when it binds FBP, it changes the fluorescence of, of, of GFP. And you can read more about it. He published it last year. This is, this is actually how it looks in tissue culture cells. So these are cells that are starved. HEC-293 cells, and we're going to see a movie now in which we give, you give them glucose, boom, the FPP increases because you have more glycolysis, oligomycin inhibit mitochondria, increases even more, 2DG, which inhibits glycolysis, decreases, and then that's it. And this is the quantification. You can quantify it. So again, FPP is the product of PFK, which is a rate limiting step in glycolysis, so it measures glycolytic flux, and these measurements serve as a, as a proxy for glycolysis and glycolytic flux. Aaron Wolf in my lab adapted this for use in C. elegans. It works beautifully. So this is the whole worm head. We are doing transient hypoxia here. And there's hypoxia. It increases in all neurons. Normoxia, it decreases. Hypoxia increases. Normoxia decreases. And you can, this is actually a, a version of the sensor that we made as a control. You're not going to see many changes because it's, they're hypoxia. There are not many changes. Normoxia, hypoxia, normoxia, right? You can quantify this. You can see here. You can use it in single cells. This is in AIY. Normo hypoxia, it increases. And then normoxia, you're going to see that it's going to um, decrease right there. And so um, you can, one of the nice things about C. elegans is you can try mutants. So we can try mutants for glycolysis. Like, for example, we're measuring FPP. So if you get rid of PFK, you shouldn't see a signal. And that's exactly what happens. These are PFK mutants. If you get rid of PGK, however, you're gonna see more signal. Why? Because you're not gonna be consuming the FPP. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. This is the PGK mutant. This is the wild type here. 
and and we can induce we can look at these genotypes in the context of inducing hypoxia or stimulating the neurons which Aaron has started to do so do this this is the final two slides do the glycolytic protein localization affects glycolysis these are early days for this question but we have some exciting data this is all preliminary but I wanted to share it with you from Ian Gonzalez. So I told you that these two different isoforms show different localization. So how do they look when you actually get rid of the gene and you rescue with these different isoforms? So this is what he's doing here. So this is the wild type, you induce hypoxia, but you have an increasing glycolysis. When you have GPI mutant, which is this red line here, you don't get, you don't get any signal because this is upstream of the production of FBP. But when you put the this version that actually is the one that's localized into synapses, this is what you see, this black line here, suggesting so high glycolytic levels all the time. We believe that this version is an, it represents an overactive glycolysis state. And we don't know how it's being regulated yet, but, we build, but, but the, the result is pretty clear. So we're excited to understand how the cell biology of this enzyme, which is the localization to the synapses, actually relates to this uh, production of, of FBP that we're seeing. This is a summary of that. So you, so yeah, I'm just gonna skip over that. And um, so last slide. So our hypothesis is that these fundamental metabolic pathways such as glycolysis are spatiotemporally regulated in living cells and that that underpin processes such as synaptic function and plasticity. And, you know, in our, in our cartoon diagrams and in our minds, the mitochondria is very much in focus, but we know far less about where glycolysis is happening. And if this is actually true, then, and, and we're finding evidence that it is, then that means there's a whole level of regulation at a cell biological level of metabolism, which is fundamental for cell function that we don't understand. There's an increasing number of diseases associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. We believe glycolysis will then be neuroprotective and it's important to understand it. I, as I mentioned before, aerobic glycolysis is important for brain metabolism. We believe glycolysis is foreshadowing and serving the, the plasticity needs of synapses. And many synapses do not have mitochondria, and we believe that they're being powered by mechanisms like the one that I showed you today. So it has to do, our, the thing that we're really interested on now is the cell biology of glycolysis in neuroenergetics. So that is my talk today. I quiero agradecer nuevamente a los organizadores por esta oportunidad. Este es el laboratorio que hizo el trabajo. Aquí está Andrea, que es una de las organizadoras. Las personas que trabajaron en este proyecto fueron Ian González, Aaron Wolf, Snucha Ravikumar y, y Milind Singh. Y estos son los, los, uh, nuestros colaboradores y las personas que, no, que nos permiten hacer el trabajo. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Daniel, for this beautiful talk. So now it's open for questions. So, thank you very much, Daniel, for the wonderful talk. I just have a, a couple of short questions. One is the, the condition of hypoxia that you use, 0.5% oxygen, 1%. The other, the other question is, is what happens if hypoxia is uh, persist a little bit? When what happens with the this non lipidic compartment or yeah, yeah. glycolytic so, metabolism? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the first question: What are the conditions of hypoxia that we use? I call it hypoxia because we, when we did these experiments, we calibrated the instrument and we saw the same conditions if we went up to like. I think oh, I'm trying to remember now. I think it was like up to five percent oxygen. We will still see the same dynamics. Out of really laziness on our part, we usually induce anoxia, and the reason is because it's really easy to just flow nitrogen through for short periods of time. But if we do it when we did mix it with oxygen, then we haven't mixed it with oxygen. I, I say laziness, but in reality, we'll mix it with oxygen because we we haven't ordered the tanks that have the oxygen in it, and then we didn't want to do it. Kind of ad hoc because then that would be another variable so we just use nitrogen and that makes them transiently anoxic but when we did do it for the paper we saw the same the same thing so i don't think it will vary um so that's the answer to the first question the the second question if you induce hypoxia for prolonged periods of time these things become solid they come become a uh, gel like so we did frap analysis on them 
and their ability to recover uh, the the PFK condenses, their ability to recover is far diminished, and they become far more viscous. And that's something that has been observed also for other condensates that are um, either induced for prolonged periods of time or are in in toxic form. So I, we believe that this eventually this the the um, uh, the biophysical properties of the condensates change. The the their ability also to rescue. The or to sustain, you know, like I show you, um, glycolysis is sufficient to to sustain under those conditions the synaptic vesicle cycle. Uh, per our phenotypes that we're observing of the of the localization of the synaptic vesicles, their ability to do that decreases if you hold hypoxia for for prolonged periods of time. So these things are not um, um, allowing the animal to to continue with the synaptic vesicle cycle past like half an hour, forty minutes. Thank you very much. One question related to that is of the transient hypoxia is whether LDH, lactic dehydrogenase, uh, also is in the metabolome because you need NADH to recycle glycolysis. Yeah. So oh, I yeah. wonder whether it's also in the this there, metabolome. So I didn't have time to talk about um, about uh, Snucha Ravikumar's work, but it's precisely that. So LDH also affects um uh, this process and uh you're absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah your intuition is completely correct i we believe it's nadh we haven't measured nadh she has been arguing that it's nadh she has evidence through genetics that is nadh she'll be very excited to hear that you that you thought so <laughs> because, because that's what she has been uh loving for but 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 she has beautiful genetic evidence that is consistent with the hypothesis that you propose in another study that i didn't have time to share that has a little bit to do that, that you remind me of when you're asking this question about LDH is that we have evidence that these condensates that are forming in neurons are also responding to the metabolic state of the hypodermal cell. So we believe there's a communication kind of reminiscent of the, of the uh, lactate shunt that has been shown between glia and neurons that in C. elegans is happening between the hypodermal cell that is somehow communicating with the neuron to induce the formation of these condensates that we believe foreshadow the needs, the metabolic needs that are going to happen under energy stress for the animal. Hey, Daniel, this is Piali. Nice to see you in silico. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how does this process ensure the um, presence of every enzyme in the cascade and the correct stoichiometric metric ratio in these individual foci? So we so first we haven't shown that every so that I would be more conservative because we have seen that these enzymes are co-localizing, but we haven't shown that every enzyme is there. Like we have probably gone through through two thirds of them. It has been harder than I thought because of the different isoforms and the different versions, and we have very little understanding now. Now with Sengen, we have much better understanding, but before Sengen, we have very little understanding of what enzyme was where. So we're, we're characterizing that now, seeing if the mutants give us phenotype in the neurons, if we can rescue it in the neurons. So we don't know that, we don't know that yet. My fantasy, so I don't know the answer to your question, but my fantasy would be that there will be biophysical principles, like the ones that I just described, that are kind of like bringing these enzymes together ad hoc. And what this, the, the beautiful thing about these enzymes is that they're kind of like molecular computers in that they're, they're, they're complex in their allosteric sites that inhibit their function, that prevent their tetamerization, that prevent their higher order oligomers. So you can think, you can start daydreaming when you look at them of biochemical mechanisms that are affecting the biophysics and the interactions of these, of these enzymes, the biophysics in the sense of their multivalent interactions with each other. If, if for example, the levels of ATP are low, something as simple as that, you can imagine in a compartment, those enzymes will come together and then increase the levels of ATP. Like you can start imagining mechanisms like that, but we don't know if that is the case yet. Another question there. Thanks for me. I thank you for the very stimulating uh, uh, talk. I was wondering if you have tried the uh, correlative light electron microscopy to to localize uh, and to see what these condensates are at the higher resolution. And uh, I think it's not that surprising, right? That the different proteins are, are localized in the cytoplasm, proteins, mRNAs, et cetera. So why do you think that, that it had taken so long to, to look specifically for the uh, glycolytic enzymes? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So so the first question, we, we haven't done it yet. It's something that we want to do. We were gearing up to do. We are uh, building the reagents to be able to do that. But since we published this paper, other groups have shown that this happens in other organisms. So uh, John Kim, who also works in C. elegans, he also has studies in yeast. He observed a similar uh, co-localization of glycolytic proteins in, ye in yeast. And he, in yeast, he actually did do the electron microscopy and saw the formation of these condensates. Um, the second question is, I, I honestly, I, I can only speak from my own experience. I, I, I didn't do it before because I thought that this, my framework was that these proteins are going to be diffusely localized in the cytosol. So I had no reason to think that they wouldn't be. And, and it's relatively easy to do in C. elegans, but it will be much harder to do this study in, you know, a transgenic mouse. So you, you'll need a lot of resources to make a transgenic mouse. It, it's not as expensive to do it in a fly, but it's still, you know, a month of work. So why do it? Now, if you, once you know this, if you go back and look at the literature, there's studies from the early 2000s, for example, in Drosophila that showed that by antibodies, there were there was localization, specific localization of specific isoforms of glycolytic proteins into the fly muscles. And those isoforms were part, were important for powering those muscles and not another isoform. If you try to put another isoform that didn't have that localization, but did have the enzymatic activity, it was incapable of rescuing. So all of a sudden things start making sense. But I don't think it was, at least for me, it wasn't it wasn't that intuitive. In the other place where you could look at this is tissue culture cells. But the problem with tissue culture cells is that they are under conditions that will be equivalent of diabetic dia uh, of being diabetic for us. So it's it's a ton of sugar. They're they're not under conditions that are, these are cancer cells many times that are not under conditions like the metabolism conditions that cells in vivo usually find themselves in. So I don't think that that looking at the localization of these proteins in 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 that context will tell you what's happening in a normal context. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel, for, for your talk and for being here. Thank you. Okay, so we have a poster session now. We are a little bit late, so we can go there. Gracias, Daniel. Gracias.